Thank you, thank you. What a pleasure it is to be here. I'm here to talk about children and nature at this extraordinary, I think, inspiring TEDx conference in Pittsburgh, a conference focused on the future for children. So I think throughout the conference, the theme of children has been well represented. I didn't see a lot of attention yet to nature. So I decided I'd bring in some falling leaves, and I'm just going to toss some <laughs> a few leaves out in the audience to remind us that this is a season for change and that all of us are intricately tied and connected to the natural world. E.O. Wilson at Harvard coined the phrase or used the term biophilia to talk about the human connection to the natural world. You know, it supports us all. And what is going on at this point in time is really a change in childhood. So I'd like to ask each of you to think about that change with me at this moment. Think about your own childhood for just a moment. Think about those special places where you were. Did anybody ever say something like this to you? Go outside and play, and don't come home till it's dark. <laughs> something like that. Well, that really isn't happening today. Childhood has changed. I like to think in terms of what I call the ecology of hope. There's nothing more important for each of us to believe in a, in a better future. And children need that in their hearts. They need to believe that they can be a part of a positive, healthy future. And one of the keys to that, one of the keys, is to open the door and make sure they have a chance to turn over a rock and experience a sense of wonder, to see the stars on a crystal clear night, to feel the breaths of fresh air in their lives. And all of that fits together in what I like to think of as an ecology of hope. So I'm a part of uh, an effort, really worldwide, to reconnect children. Part of a, a movement, in fact, to facilitate an awareness of how important the children-nature connection is for children's healthy development for their health and well-being. So I took this picture, actually, in South Africa a few years ago, and it always reminds me, one, of the power of hope, and two, that this issue of a disconnect in children's everyday lives from the experience of the natural world is worldwide. It's kicking up in nations everywhere, in developed and in emerging economies, it affects every ethnic group on Earth, and it affects every income group. There's certainly a powerful indication of this in the United States, but I just looked at a recent study, 16 nations around the world, and very, very, very few children spend any significant time outdoors just exploring, experiencing that sense of wonder that's so important, again, for their healthy development. I think about also that whereas I focus on children's health and well-being, their cognitive, their emotional, their social, their spiritual, their physical development, a byproduct of this connection with the natural world is that we grow up to care. We grow up more prepared to make informed decisions. We grow up more prepared to really face the challenges that are incumbent on all of us to address in order to keep the planet itself healthy for the long term. So that, an image from just a few weeks ago in the Grand Tetons. A friend of mine, now a colleague, wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. Richard Lube is the author of that book, he coined the phrase, nature deficit disorder, and he would be the first to say that's not a medical diagnosis. It's simply a description of a change in society and a change in humans' relationship to the natural world that supports us all. So Rich talks about the importance of healing this broken bond, this broken bond between our young and the natural world, and would point out, and I share this view, that it's in everyone's self-interest to do so. 
I believe that healthy communities are the foundation for peace in the world. I believe that healthy communities begin with healthy children. And one of the ways we can most powerfully assure the opportunity for every child to grow with this sense of self, self-confidence, self-discipline, excitement, imagination, creativity, all of that, is to give them the experiences in their everyday lives, at home, at school, where they play, where they learn, where they live, to have this fabric of natural systems, again, a part of their everyday lives. This little one reminds me, she um, was about a year and a half, almost two, when this photo was taken. A little one who, when she would get stressed, her mom had fussy, you know, cried a little. Her mom had the, had the sort of instinct to open the door and go outside, and whenever she did that, little Molly would calm down. So think with me for a moment about how we want to stimulate children's, again, cognitive and emotional and physical development. It begins with their ability to see patterns, to be attracted to sounds. So this little one is getting a great beginning in terms of her health and well-being. Even while we're looking at this lovely image in the, in the high country of Colorado, let me describe very briefly some of the indicators of the, of the deficit, of the disconnect that are going on right now. The obesity epidemic, about 4% of children in the 1960s were considered obese or overweight, severely overweight. Now that number is running at about 20%. And in some communities, it's well more than that, 30% and higher. With that obesity epidemic, there's a higher incidence of diabetes in children, of, 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 of just, you know, a disease normally reserved, in the, for the most part, uh, for adults and now hitting children in, in uh, extreme numbers. Attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, all kinds of difficulties in focus and concentration, an increase in myopia among young people. So there are a number of indicators that things are out of balance in children's lives. I am not at all against technology. May I say that clearly? And certainly, you know, at a TED conference, absolutely. We all welcome and appreciate the innovation and the power of technology in our lives. Having said that, the Kaiser Family Foundation indicates through some of their research that children are spending anywhere from 40 to 65 hours a week hooked into what I call the electronic umbilica. That's a characteristic of a childhood out of balance. So we can keep the technology in children's lives. At the same time, we can create school environments, home environments, neighborhoods, and rooftops where it's possible for children to play and connect and exercise their imagination and really uh, learn what it is that supports all of us uh, on this planet. Now, some of the indicators of the benefits to children. Just to summarize, a few years ago, I pulled together some of the best of the best of the research and really looked to see what would be the indicators of the benefits to children from this, you know, built into us through all of human development, this human connection to the natural world. And so in looking at all of these studies, I found, you know, 27% increase in science scores in uh, students who had the experience of outdoor-based uh, learning laboratories or learning classrooms, you know, schoolyard habitat projects and things of that kind. I found there's a lot of evidence accumulating that the uh, factors associated with or the characteristics of attention deficit disorder are mitigated when children have the opportunity to get outside. Uh, stress goes down, focus increases, self-discipline uh, is enhanced. So when I looked at all this body of research, I finally said, you know, I can summarize this, and I'm not going to be, I don't mean to be at all glib about it, but children are literally happier, healthier, and smarter. They do better in school. They're more cooperative. They're more creative. They have a more powerful sense of self-esteem when these connections, again, are a part of their everyday lives. And this is stuff that it's pretty easy we can do. 
uh, Richard Lube and I did form a new nonprofit called the Children and Nature Network. And we're inspired every day by what people are doing, again, throughout the world to make these kinds of changes. It's as simple sometimes as giving kids a bucket of, of twigs and leaves, as I brought to you all today, and rocks and stones, and letting them just build something. It's as easy as um, putting a garden in the backyard, or again, in core inner city environments, there's a lot of good work going on to go to the roof. If the streets aren't safe, we can make a healthy environment on the rooftop and people are doing that. And a new kind of neighborhood watch is emerging, where people take turns uh, walking the kids to school. I didn't mention this, but in oh, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, uh, most children, not all, but three quarters anyway, would walk or ride a bike to school. Now it's fewer than one in five. There are changes all around us that have accumulated in the last 30 years, they've escalated in the last 10 years, and we can all do something about it. It's not hard, it doesn't take money, for the most part, it takes time. So some of the resources that we're encouraging have been brought to us by others, and we're just, as a network, we're not running programs, we're just trying to create an ecology. We're trying to connect good people and good works. We're trying to feature uh, the ways that we can make positive change uh, to, again, give every child everywhere the opportunity to grow and learn and, and flourish. So natural teachers, uh, natural leaders, I'll make a comment about that. This is the age group from 15 to 29 who are committed to opening the door for younger kids and getting them outdoors. Our natural leaders coordinator for this effort is Juan Martinez uh, from Los Angeles, a young man who grew up in the barrio there, and said to me recently, he said, Cheryl, you know, I, I was 15 before I ever saw a sky full of stars. And he said, when I was a child, the first avian species I was introduced to, and some of you may have heard this, but was what we called the ghetto bird. And so, he said, the ghetto bird was the police helicopter. And so until he was 15, his life really didn't change. Now, for the most part, from birth to about 11 or 12 is when some of this healthy development is so important and when the bonding with the natural world is so important. But having said that, you know, change can occur at any point in anyone's lives in adulthood as well. So hope. Hope is so very important. And when I think about hope in childhood. Hope comes from a sense of, again, believing that I can make a difference. It's tied up with a term called efficacy, again, a belief that I can do something and make some positive changes. Well, hope takes action, too. David Orr says, hope is a verb with its shirt sleeves rolled up. I think we have a lot of work to do, and yet it's fun to make these connections, to make it possible for children uh, to have the, the fresh air, the opportunities for creativity, the, the opportunities to naturally gain in their self-confidence and self-esteem through something as simple as opening the door and going outside. So through the, the work of the Children and Nature Network worldwide, we're really trying to foster uh, this kind of uh, positive change um, that I think is inherently built into us and, again, is, is fun. It's good for families. When children and families get together and go outdoors, you know, everybody has a good time, and some of the most precious of memories are fostered and, and nourished. We had a young teacher... Uh, a man who's a second-grade teacher in Roanoke, Virginia, come to us a year or so ago. He and his wife and their three children, a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old, would go out every week and just have some sort of nature-based adventure. They'd go to a park or they'd go you know, for a hike, but they live in, again, uh, in, a, in a relatively uh, urbanized environment. Uh, but at the same time, the five-year-old one day said, how come nobody else is out here having as much fun as we are? And so they sat around the, the kitchen table during a holiday season, and they said, what can we do about this? And they decided they would form what they called a nature club for families. And the little boy yet again said, well, let's put it in the paper. Let's put it on radio. Let's tell people that we're going to do this and meet us at this park on this weekend. Well, now more than 400 families have signed up. And once a month, you know, not every one of those 400 gets out together, but they're having fun. They're creating a lifetime of memories, and it's fostering and nourishing, again, children's healthy development. In the end, 
in the end, when we think about leaving this conference and what we can do, each one of us can make a change. Each one of us can open a door. Each one of us can take a child outside. We'll be refreshed. We'll find that there are benefits to each of us from all of that. And at the same time, in the simplest and most powerful of ways, we'll be creating opportunities for children to have really um, the optimal uh, environments in which to learn and grow. This is obviously one dimension of a healthy childhood, and it's one, though, that is missing. At a time when we have a culture of depression, at a time when some of the medical community are saying that this will be the first generation not to live as long as its parents, this is something, this is a challenge each one of us can help with. So each one of us can do something. Each one of us can take a moment. One of the indicators of children who grow up to care passionately about the environment and get involved in doing things uh, on its behalf in whatever area of work they might be, one of the most powerful indicators is that sometime in childhood, an adult took that young person outside and shared a special place that he or she cared about. And so in the end, the child not only learned to love the natural environment, through that experience of wonder and, and uh, care being demonstrated by the older person. But at the same time, and perhaps even more important, the child felt valued. The child felt valued by that person taking the time to share that experience. So each one of us can do that. One of the ways in which other people, and you included, can help. I'm looking for a group of creative attorneys who will get together and help us address some of the liability issues that get in the way, or at least in the minds of some folks. We're having a growing number of pediatricians who are prescribing nature play because it's good for children, good for their health, good for their well-being. You can help, you can encourage that. More planners, city planners, developers, landscape designers can make it easier for children to have safe places and access to places to run and play. There are so many things. So think with me and with others about children's everyday lives. And when we make those kinds of changes, again, everyone will be refreshed. There's an enhanced aesthetic. And, you know, communities overall are healthier. A number of months ago, I spoke at a... Um, actually, it's longer ago than that now. But I was talking, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to talk to a group of adults. I was asked to speak to 700 fourth and fifth graders. I was terrified. And so I'm talking to this group of kids, and at one point, you know, it's about these issues, about the importance of nature in our lives, that kind of thing. And so this little girl, I finally said, let me see if someone from this group of 700 will come up to the stage with me. And so this little girl walked up, and she, she was, these are fourth and fifth graders. She was a fifth grader. She was about 10 or 11 years old. She took the microphone. She was so self-confident. And she said, I think nature is important in my life because I feel better when I'm outside. Turns out she was diagnosed with ADHD. She knew what was good for her. The kids know. Thank you very much for your time and attention.